Thank you, Jillian. Good afternoon, LF Europe Member Summit. My Ooh. name is, hey, hey, yeah. That's here, what a wonderful group. Um, I have the honor and the privilege of presenting insights from Linux Foundation Research this afternoon on recently published and soon to publish reports. And uh, the subject matter I'll be covering today are Europe's public sector opportunity, digging into findings from the Europe Spotlight report, and digging into our results of open source for sustainability. For those of you not familiar with Linux Foundation Research, we um, were founded in 2021 with the sole purpose of describing what is taking place across open source communities. Uh, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and the scope of that um, mandate was incredibly broad. As you all know, open source is vast. Uh, even if you look at the Linux Foundation alone, we have more than 900 projects today. So trying to organize uh, research in a meaningful way meant that we had to create frameworks. And so the four frameworks that we have at LF Research uh, to categorize our initiatives are the following. We conduct research along technology horizontals, um, everything on this list from AI through to web application development, WASM being uh, one of the latest examples. Industry verticals, you heard from Luchin Balea this morning from RTE describing some of our research efforts in the energy sector. Um, we look at ecosystem-wide issues, uh, topics that don't fit neatly into one given industry or within a, a technology, but apply cross industries and cross technologies. Subject like, subjects like governance or diversity, equity, inclusion, or even cybersecurity, topics that touch uh, various parts of our community. And finally, most recently, we launched a new framework to explore open source by geographic region. And so that's the focus of Europe and this community is to really understand what is the European open source opportunity? What are the European specific challenges? How does Europe compare to the Americas and to Asia Pacific? Where is it leading? Where is it lagging? So these are the kinds of questions we're really excited to have the opportunity to address, and I'm so thrilled that we can share the findings uh, with you in the community today and uh, in the weeks ahead. So why do we do this? Well, apart from creating a bunch of really good data, we're certainly not about creating research for the sake of it. Um, we want our research to be able to uh, uh, inform decision-making, inform budgets, inform uh, and inspire project formation, inspire collaboration, uh, encourage contributions to our communities, essentially create uh, awareness and uh, inspire activations across all facets of our community. We want you to use this material as a resource. We have a vast library of research available to you and your organizations which essentially is uh, convince my boss about why I should be part of LF Europe. Convince my boss why we need to send contributors into this project. Let's up our budget. Let's, let's grow our contributions. And, and research, I hope, can be the tool that helps you in your conversations make the case for why what we're doing here is so important and how our projects are having an impact. Ultimately, we, we're telling stories about journeys, about Luchin's journey at RTE, and about the journey of the Academy Software Foundation, about the journey of, of um, uh, other leaders. Um, and so dig in, and um, what, I've, what, what I've done in this presentation is try to capture some of that storytelling uh, through quotes. Uh, we like to engage our communities as much as possible and co-create research with people, give people the opportunity to share their insights. That's really what it's all about. So our first effort that was specific to Europe was this time last year when uh, Linux Foundation Europe was first formed. We published a research report, the, the 2022 Spotlight, uh, which identified opportunities and, challenge, and challenges around European open source. And it identified some significant gaps, most, um, most specifically related to the public sector. 
and the fact that the public sector in Europe was failing to capitalize on the open source opportunity, uh, where contribution was encouraged in only 29% of our public sector respondents versus the mean of 46%. So what do we do with that? Well, now Gab and Mirko and, and Rima, we're trying to close that gap and build bridges with uh, the public sector and engage uh, the public sector constituents in, in open source. There's also a significant policy imbalance. People within organizations don't have proper uh, guidelines. They don't have the necessary tools that, or they don't have the permission to contribute back upstream. And how do we change internal policies so that we can have our, our employees contribute code or, or participate in fixing a vulnerability? So those were some gaps identified in 2022. We also hosted a round table in Dublin at Open Source Summit Europe last year. Some of you were part of that conversation where we literally went around the room and said, what do we need here in Europe and how is it unique and what do we need to do? And essentially, we, 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 it was determined that a, a public sector and policymaker awakening was very much needed. We needed better educational materials. We needed research. Uh, we needed data. And um, some more focused Europe-centric research was mandated. And I had the pleasure of leading that effort once again this year. Uh, with a public sector report. And the questions we asked in that report were what government entities were leading in the transformation. I think some of the most powerful inspiration we can find is who is who's doing inspiring, valuable work in open source today? What are their stories? What are their journeys? And if they can do it, others can do it. And so it was a matter of, of rounding up um, the landscape uh, through a series of interviews. And could we generate a blueprint? Uh, at Open Forum Europe's Policy Summit in February early this year, there was a panel about the need for a public sector blueprint. And research would help uh, create um, uh, such a utility. And so very clear was, right, we have to get on this. And tomorrow, again, as Gab mentioned, our QR code's not live yet, but tomorrow, I will be very pleased to, to publish European Public Sector Open Source Opportunity, co-authored by Mirko Bohm, Kaylin Osborne, who's uh, presently at Peking University doing research, and Anna Jimenez Santa Maria. Anna, are you here in the room? I saw Anna at lunch from the To Do Group. So a wonderful collaboration, and I'll describe briefly uh, the good news that came as a result of, of this effort. Um, European Union and member states have been championing, and I should say Europe broadly, it's not just the European Union, but in Europe, um, there's been a championing of open source software for over two decades. Uh, there are strategies at the European Commission, uh, there are laws and directives that mandate open source software use first before other alternatives. Uh, there are prog open source program offices within the European Union. The ethos that public code and public money kind of go hand in hand, uh, espoused by the Free Software Foundation of Europe. Europeans uh, working teams on the digital commons, the importance of open source software as a pathway to create digital sovereignty. And uh, recently, Germany's Center for Digital Sovereignty, the Digital Tech Fund, um, or the Sovereign Tech Fund's investment in OpenJS Foundation. This is the good news. The bad news is that we still have challenges to confront. Uh, there's a deep need to reduce vendor lock-in across um, the region. There is still limited awareness of the value proposition for open source software among decision makers, which makes research and resources so valuable. Uh, there is a culture uh, present in certain countries that people value what they pay money for. And so there's this notion that free means it's cheap, it's lesser, which is not the case. And we have to change that mindset that, that even though it is freely available, it is highly valuable. There is a contribution gap um, and 
security has put open source software in the spotlight with potentially harmful regulation. As we all know, the CRA looms large and it is on the minds of, of, of everyone in the community. And so the study sought to understand these dynamics, understand the state of open source in the public sector in the context of, of what we know to be true today, identify the barriers and the enablers, um, and the priorities for Europe's open source future. And as I said previously, to, to better understand who's leading the transformation and what could stakeholders learn from them. Uh, stories and journeys are important, and I hope that you'll find inspiration in the stories and journeys that are uncovered in this uh, paper. How did we go about it? We, f we began the study with a comprehensive review of the literature as a standard practice at LF Research. What publications existed today? What could we learn from them? And how could we make sure that the research we're doing is differentiated from what's already published? We conducted 30 interviews, uh, including 21 experts from the public sector, nine experts from industry and civil society organizations. There was a, a, a fairly decent uh, gender mix among the interviewees, um, a third female, 20, um, uh, two thirds male, and a good cross section of geographies were represented, numerous countries listed here on the slide. And so key findings, uh, in the words of the European working team on digital commons, um, rightly supported digital commons can increase their role as a pillar of Europe's digital sovereignty. The, the relationship between open source software and Europe charting a path to digital sovereignty is firmly, firmly established in, uh, in this report. It is viewed as a mechanism for independence from US tech giants. And Aster, if you're here, I know Aster was on a call, Aster was uh, one of our interviewees and helped us um, by way of making connections to people who are at the forefront of public sector implementations. And so the, there is widespread recognition of open source software's value proposition. Um, but we need more than rhetoric. So the benefits are understood, but now is the time for concrete action at high levels of government to mobilize resources. If you think of um, the film with Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr., um, show me the money. Yeah, Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Resources really matter. It's all part of the big sustainability picture. And it is true for open source as it is for um, football players signing, signing their contracts. Uh, I can't understate the, the value of our members and how their support enables us to do the important work that we do. Uh, so it is about the value that open source software brings to the transformation of public services. And it's not software for software's sake. Um, it is about creating citizen-centric services, doing something with the software itself. And driving forward the digital services that, that citizens and taxpayers expect. And Daniel, um, who I had the pleasure of having dinner with in, in Brussels around the time of FOSTEM and the Open Forum Europe Policy Summit, is one of the leaders in this transformation in Sweden's uh, tax agency. Thinking through the realities of vendor lock-in and how he can make alternative choices through open source software. And so the need to drive digital sovereignty with open source software came through very clearly. It is unquestionably seen as a driver um, to reduce vendor lock-in, to maintain control over IT systems, uh, to be able to review an audit software. Uh, this was is extremely well established in our interview process. And if sovereignty is the goal, investment in open source sustainability is, is the necessity. Um, there is need for investment so that our software can be maintained and it can remain secure. And again, I want to call it Germany Sovereign Tech Funds. Um, ah, that should be $875,000 investment in OpenJS Foundation <laughs> as a promising start. Yes, I changed it on my phone, but it didn't update there. Ah, alas, tech. 
So we need more actors funding. We need more funders funding, and we need more coordination of the funders. And so that's where community comes into play. And so the key enablers from going from policy into practice and that community building exercise, um, while open source really is a priority for, for public administrators, the problem is the how. It's not so much the what. The what's the easy part of this. We know what open source does. We know how it functions, but how we make it work, how we uh, grow the communities, how we collaborate, and how we achieve sustainability, those are the tough questions to answer. And, and I wish the research could provide us with the answers, but it's up to us now. We have to figure this conundrum out. And as much as we are uh, of like minds, and this is wonderful to have everybody in the room, I think we have to ask ourselves, who should be in the room who's not in the room? That's our, that's our challenge. It's getting the right people in the room to solve for that how, how we build the community. And, and part of that answer is letting OSPOs um, do their thing. OSPOs, the open source program offices, uh, established for um, whether they're called an OSPO or not, it, the point is about having best practices um, as, as facilitators of effective open source software operations and activity uh, and facilitating contributions um, and really leveling up the, the, the strategy of open source within an organization. So OSPOs are incredibly important to help us solve this conundrum. It's the place where you figure out how to give Back. And that's the hardest thing, is, is the contributing. And the giving back is present not just in the Europe research, not just in the public policy research that we do, but across all the research, the constant theme of the usage versus contribution gap. This, is, this exists, and it, it's largely due to lack of clarity around policy. It's due to lack of leadership. It's all something, it's something that we, as a community, need to work on. We need to increase development and discovery of tooling and resources. This is something that I'm working on at Linux Foundation, about how do we pool all of our various resources together? We have a lot of projects at the LF, from the Chaos Project to Open Chain to the To-Do Group. Uh, we've got training certification, but they're, they're scattered. We actually need to bring them together for discovery. How do you discover all the resources about management and best practices? And by the way, that includes research reports. I've done a bunch of research. My research lives in the research portal. To-do group has some. LFAI data has some. But we need, to, we, need, we need to do a better job so that guidance and manuals can be discoverable. But it goes beyond the Linux Foundation. Goes, it, it's for the whole community. Um, we also need to uh, improve the interpretation of uh, legislation and avoid litigation. And, and tooling and manuals help with that. So let's get the word out there about best practices. Um, and in the word of, of Chris Delvire, a CTO um, from uh, Estonia, it's not good enough just to build and publish open source and then hope that reusability and engagement from users will come. It's rare when that happens. And we typically do not form projects under the LF without that community of collaboration well established. Uh, it's, it, it's not for the sake of it. Um, you, it needs so much more than that. So let's learn from our current examples. Um, and the shining star in this research is municipalities. And why is that? Municipalities are just free to innovate in a way that countries are not. Their bylaws, their governance structures make innovation uh, so much easier. We see it time and time again. The example uh, reference in this report is the OS2 network. 80% of Denmark's municipalities are collaborating uh, in, in 24 open source software solutions. In France, we see shining examples of um, smart cities. Dijon being one that I'm most familiar with. Connected cities using data and connecting different public services 
IoT devices saying, hey, this rubbish bin, this garbage is full. Somebody needs to come and change that. Or, oh, there's a traffic accident at this intersection. We need to reroute the traffic and have better traffic flows. That's all digital. Municipalities are incredibly innovative in ways that the public sector um, and higher levels of government are not. So what can, what can, uh, what can federal and, and higher order governments learn from municipal governments? Um, and again, no, open source software is not the aim. Uh, it's the means of ensuring public sector control of software solutions. So says uh, Rasmus Frey from our uh, uh, Danish uh, municipalities example. And so the recommendations from this report, we want to accelerate the shift from user to leader, creating OSPOs, creating upstream contribution policies, more funding. Um, and also we heard earlier about Daniel uh, Goldscheider talking about government advisory councils and bridging those conversations, making sure that we have the right people in the room and there's a way to do it uh, and be compliant. Um, and we want to leverage the best way uh, to make those connections. So OSPO creation is great, but we also want to double down on empowering the OSPO to make open source software a strategic consideration for the organization. And again, build those relationships. Um, invest in your people, invest in the OSPO as a structure, invest in best practices, and empower your leaders. We do, in this process, also want to avoid uh, regional fragmentation um, and, and not have Europe become its own kind of digital silo, but cr create in Europe and be able to scale those solutions that benefit the rest of the world. Um, creating by Europe for Europe is, is wonderful, but let's keep the global context of open source in mind because I still think we're better together as a global uh, community. And of course, funding. Um, funding, that money conversation, <laughs> it's a tough one to have, but it, it, it really matters. Um, our, our public sector needs to take the proper steps to funding open source digital infrastructure, follow the steps of Germany's sovereign tech fund, um, and shift to long-term funding plans. We want to build those bridges for, for expertise exchange. Um, and again, that's where our work begins today. We, we know what we need to do now. It's a matter of going about, it's the how. That's the hard part, how we build these bridges. That's the, that's the real ch challenge is when we leave Bilbao, how we go and do what we know needs to happen. And with that, um, I will turn my attention to the second report that comes out tomorrow, uh, the Europe Spotlight 2023 report. Again, this QR code doesn't go live until tomorrow, um, but if you scan, uh, if you're there at the keynotes, you'll have uh, a, a repeat of the slide. So what were the objectives? Looking at the trends, the activity, usage, uh, and contribution. What were the opportunities, the challenges, uh, the benefits, um, the strengths and the weaknesses, and so on? Uh, many, many objectives uh, to explore in this report. What was our methodology? Well, once again, we partnered with the same group who authored the report last year, Scott Logic, a UK-based technology consultancy. Uh, we launched a survey, which we fielded for three months, uh, between April and June. Uh, we had 307 completes. Uh, this was part of a global study, so, the, so each region had more or less the same number of uh, complete responses so that we could make uh, regional comparisons um, between Asia Pacific, Europe, and the Americas, uh, with a, f a fairly decent margin of error, uh, ranging between 85% and 95% um, confidence. As well, we conducted interviews with uh, 15 subject matter experts from across different industries and uh, a range of uh, countries represented. And so what were the findings? Year over year, I would say it's a good story. Um, the perceived value of open source software is increasing. It's up to 57% this year, where it was at 47% last year. That's a great stat. Um, except in the public sector, uh, where half of the respondents felt that open source's value stayed the same. Uh, other, 
uh, it was compared to 25% of respondents from other industries where open source's value increased. There's a heightened interest in generative AI. I think that keeps, um, uh, that, that's consistent with, with the news and broad societal challenges. That came through very loudly and very clearly in this year's survey data. Um, the consumption or usage and contribution gap persists. Nothing's changed. Sorry. <laughs> Our work continues at Linux Foundation to help bridge the, the uh, usage contribution gap. Um, and the um, good news, nothing's really in, in steep decline. So onward, onward. So let's explore the, the gap between open source, um, uh, the value gap. So over the last year, how, how has the business value your organization derives from open source software use? How has that changed? Uh, and this is where we get that 57% figure. It's increased either a little or a lot. And that's a very, very healthy indicator that organizations are seeing value in the use of uh, open source software. Um, and a, a significant number, these, are, th th these bars are green and that's a healthy sign. Um, the benefits exceed the costs, and the benefits greatly exceed the costs in 40% of the time. So there's a lot of, of um, positive sentiment around open source uh, usage. Essentially, why is this? Organizations are looking to reduce uh, their vendor spend, uh, lower their total cost of ownership, a faster time to market. All the things that we know to be true about the value of open source were present and came through both survey data and the interview process. Uh, it's a critical tool for innovation, and uh, the importance of collaborating on open standards uh, came through. Uh, and this, the importance of standards comes through other research as well. Um, what's, how do we measure the economic value of research? That was a report published earlier this year, and, and driving innovation, driving standards were, were leading um, results of, of, of the value statement. Uh, this opportunity to learn from one another. Remember, not all the smartest people work for your organization. Um, many brains, this came through. We were delighted to have attribution from the financial services sector in this research. This is hard to get, I have to say. Getting people to be quoted from the financial services industry, it's a highly, highly regulated industry. Nobody wants to go on the record. Our, the first year we did financial services research, everybody contributed insights anonymously. The second year we did research, we got a little bit of attribution. This year we're doing the report, we're getting more people go on the record with their name, their title, and their organization. This is a healthy signal. And again, open source is, is highly useful and free, need not mean non-commercial. So in the words of AWS, a key way they support open source is to provide the services running around those projects. Um, there's opportunity, it abounds. And so let's explore now the value gap between use and contribution. This is a persisting um, issue. Uh, we asked our survey respondents over the last year, has the overall uh, benefit your organization derives from open source software contributions changed. And those contributions have only increased a little, only increased a lot, this 44%, it, it's good, it could be better. It could be better. Contribution is, is a conundrum, it remains a conundrum. Uh, in the financial services research I'm doing right now, it's frustrating for those who understand the benefits of contribution, but internal policies prohibit contributions from being made. And the case is that, look, why, why, if we know that there's a vulnerability and our, our team members want to try to fix it, why won't you just let us? Could be resolved that much sooner. Instead, you're, you're relegating the problem solving to other people, to other organizations. It's a real problem. But again, it comes down to having those conversations with decision makers, and I hope research is a part of closing the use and contribution gap. Uh, Don Foster, Chaos, uh, makes the case that, um, you know, you don't really understand open source's benefit until you understand the benefit of upstream contribution to, to reduce risk almost more than anything else, but um, also to 
allow your team members to do something that they find incredibly fulfilling. A lot of people contribute to open source because it's a fun and stimulating thing to do. They enjoy doing it. Uh, so rethink those internal policies that prohibit it. There is a paradoxical relationship between open source and security. Um, we know that benefits from a security point of view, what makes open source software uh, known to be more secure, the transparency, the, com the confidence in the technology that that transparency enables, um, that opportunity for inspection, those things, these are, these are very, very well known. Uh, however, um, it's not enough to encourage contribution back to open source to help enrich the security even more. So where the belief is strong that open source software is more secure than closed source, among the benefits that open source software derives, security is uh, ranked quite low. How often an organization, um, in, in how often does using open source software deliver um, uh, benefits? Um, the benefits really come down to cost uh, and improved productivity and vendor lock-in. And in terms of practices, um, good practices are less prevalent than they're touted. When we asked respondents what actions they take at their organization before using a new open source software component, uh, on balance, most said 54%. Their number one uh, screening criteria, if you will, was we check the activity of the project community in terms of contributors or commits. That's not a security best practice. That's interesting that somebody's touched the code base, but that does not um, a, th a thorough uh, review make. Um, where manual uh, review was taking place, that was in 26% of the occasions. So again, this is a, a, an important lesson on uh, in code inspection as a basic uh, best practice before um, adoption of a, of, a, of a given technology. Uh, developers are looking to see if a component is actively maintained. That just means checking if there's been a commit in the last month. So it didn't come through just the survey data, came through the qualitative interviews as well. So let's unify our voices and get the word out that there are tools available, there are better practices than this. The sustainability challenge. Uh, in which areas did our respondents think there should be further investment in open source uh, across the European region? Uh, top responses um, by a margin were in terms of government adoption of open source and uh, using open source as an alternative to tech monopolies. So these are the two resonating themes here. Uh, how should the sustainability be improved? It, it's not altogether different from uh, the public sector in terms of uh, um, resourcing and OSPO formation, but the top two answers from our survey respondents were giving employees more time to work out uh, open source software challenges and having um, responsibility to, and permission to give back. Now, very briefly, how does Europe compare to the rest of the world? We're going to pr publish the global results uh, in about a month's time, but this is a preview of where Europe ranks compared to other regions. Uh, Europe, in fact, leads in the use of open source software. It is ahead in the encouragement of that use as well. Uh, it is equal to the Americas in terms of contributions and ahead of the Asia Pacific region. However, it lags globally in terms of um, the prevalence of open source program offices and in, in overall open source strategy. I'll invite you all to join a panel discussion on Wednesday uh, with uh, our author, Colin Eberhardt, 
uh, Mirko, our moderator, and Sachiko Muto of Open Forum Europe and RISE uh, Research Institutes of Sweden, who is one of our interviewees and can share her, her point of view as, as uh, somebody interviewed uh, with a very close view into what's taking place in the European open source ecosystem. On Thursday, I'll shift gears to another report on open source for sustainability. Uh, this QR code is live, <laughs> so <laughs> please get out your phones and scan away. Uh, this report um, came together, oh, it's a, definitely a labor of love uh, from my point of view, because it, it helps us describe the impact of open source software uh, projects uh, using a, a, a readily known fra uh, framework, and that's the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Here's what's interesting. In 2017, the UN Global Compact identified that open source software was instrumental in helping achieve the UN SDGs, which are a set of 17 time-bound goals that address uh, economic development and, and the myriad issues associated with it. Um, it, was, it was recognized as being extremely valuable. And this report helps us restate the value of open source software in that context. Uh, essentially, the case is made that open source represents digital public goods, and it, it, it exists to help us solve pressing global challenges. Uh, and we are not on track to make the 2030 SDGs. We're behind. Half the sustainable development goal targets are weak or insufficient. They've stalled. Uh, we know that digital is the only mechanism to help us achieve many of these goals. And we need to, to ignite and supercharge this effort to deploy um, digital and open source software as a means to, to help us make the, the targets. Countries, by the way, who are making headway in sustainability um, uh, have been outpacing their peers in progress related to the SDGs. So the LF is uniquely positioned to help accelerate uh, impact. Um, we host more than 900 projects. All of our technical projects um, enable uh, uh, the acceleration of the goals by way of infrastructure. Um, it obviously lowers the barrier to entry. The fact that we do not have to duplicate our efforts, we don't need another contain, uh, uh, cloud orchestration system, we have one. It works ubiquitously. There's the Linux kernel. There's so many examples where um, we, by way of our projects, we're simply able to drive innovation. Um, and these are critical elements for meeting the UN SDGs. As many of you know, we have projects at the Linux Foundation like AgStack and LF Energy and Green Software Foundation and a host of communities that were born with sustainability in mind. They were born with targets that related to people and the planet. But what we found is, is uh, as we heard from uh, uh, Mr. Mustafa this morning talking about Zephyr, there are a host of other projects that never were born with sustainability in mind, and yet their application for planetary good is profound. Um, and we wanted to understand what was the scope of, of our, our community's impact where SDGs was concerned, and the framework for understanding that scope was the 17 Sustainable Development Goals well-known, globally recognized, embraced by mem many of the Linux Foundation member organizations. Um, they capture the gamut of challenges, and we wanted to know how our projects were accelerating them. And as I mentioned, all of our projects ac accelerate uh, the SDGs, in particular goal nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. The fact that we create this layer of software once and don't have to duplicate efforts is significant, um, and it's exciting, and it's inspiring. Uh, other um, goals that, that we support, quality education through both open content, all of the materials that we um, have today are, are events, uh, um, events videos, webinars, um, research reports, there are free training certifications, all the open content helps advance education. We also underpin um, 
software that sustains the internet. We enable access to remote communities to, to get online and have opportunities for remote work in industries that are increasingly software defined. Quality education is, is a significant one. Same thing with Life on Land. We heard about Zephyr's Open Collar project, not only to catch, um, uh, to protect white rhinos in uh, Zimbabwe, but used in caribou, monitoring caribou in Lapland. So we want folks to get involved. We want to inspire people to um, participate in our projects, uh, to learn and collaborate and ultimately advocate. We need to get that message out that we have the resources, that our projects are the digital public goods that are going to have an impact. Um, so let's share that knowledge. There is a hackathon in San Francisco in partnership with uh, TED. Everyone knows TED Talks. They're working with LFAI and Data on a hackathon, an AI hackathon for good. That's not too late to register, so if you're interested, um, check them out. And finally, I'm going to uh, present early findings of an event, a research-focused uh, event that took place in Geneva, Switzerland uh, at the end of July. It's called Open Source Congress, and these are the origins. Of course, like all good things, it begins with research. And in January of this year, we published a report called Enabling Global Collaboration, exploring how open source communities could confront the challenges of fragmentation. How could we level up as an open source ecosystem the collaboration between and across foundations? How could we better respond to the issues? And the report identified that we had gaps in open source uh, that needed to be closed. Could we better collaborate on cybersecurity? Could we better collaborate on IP issues, on DEI, on antitrust? Um, address uh, techno-nationalism as a community? Um, and secure and safeguard our critical infrastructure and do so together, even though we are competitive foundations. How do we improve collaboration? Um, and in that effort, um, we hosted a Chatham House uh, meeting with precedent for other research reports to be conducted in such a fashion. Uh, twice over in my tenure at Linux Foundation, we've hosted uh, Chatham House uh, roundtables. These provide opportunities for people to speak freely and off the record and exchange ideas with one another. And who attended? Well, we had 65 attendees in person from a cross-section of organizations listed here, discussing security, um, policy and regulation, AI, um, and diversity, equity, inclusion issues and challenges. Uh, on balance, the, the event was well received. Uh, there was a lot of positive feedback that the content was valuable, that um, bridges were built, uh, but there's still uh, more work to be done.